Welcome everybody to episode number one of podcast. We're going to be joined today with Troy Alexander of SPI Logistics. Going to have a conversation about how to improve relationships between carriers and brokers. Without further ado, let's bring on Troy and get it started. What's going on, man? Hey, Alex, how you doing? Congratulations on the uh, new <laughs> podcast. Looks excellent. I'm honored to be here. Like this is this great. Hey, I appreciate it, bro. Thanks for being the first guest. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm excited for this conversation. I think there's a lot of, uh, I guess we could call it tension between carriers and brokers. And uh, hopefully today we can kind of see both sides of it and see how to work together rather than, uh, you know, butt heads about things. Well, look, you know, I mean, when it really comes down to it, if, uh, you know, everybody else wants to tow that line of not doing it well. That sets me apart. I'll take on all the business. I don't care. I'll be the only one that does this way, right? Yeah. Somebody said on LinkedIn a long time ago, you got to appreciate uh, the clowns in the industry because it makes the good ones stand out even more. So yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. But uh, let's get started, man. Tell me, how did you land in logistics You know, from the start? So I, I think actually something that kind of helped me get to where I'm at and maybe do stuff a little bit differently. And this might be something for uh, other people that have a similar approach to me is, is that before getting into logistics, I was on the other end, right? Like I've, I've managed warehouse facilities. I've, I've been a shipper. I've been dealing with uh, the carriers on the ground floor, loading, all of that stuff. So um, there's a different appreciation there, right? Like I didn't just jump into you know, trying to book trucks and, and move freight. I've, I've seen it from back there. Yeah, I mean, um, that's like ground zero, you know, the, the, the shipping side of things, the warehouse work. Um, I think that's right. like really underappreciated kind of part of the industry, to be honest. For sure, for sure. And then, you know, I had the, uh, the experience, I was a heavy equipment operator when I was young. I've been in construction, you know, the very beginning of my career. Um, and I studied for the CDL and was, you know, a day away from actually taking the test. But I mean, the similarities <laughs> between running your trucks and, you know, vehicle maintenance and inspection and, you know, all that stuff, it, it's very similar with the heavy equipment operation. So again, mm -hmm. that that tie to the truckers was just there. And I think then, that uh, blue collar work, like really brings a lot of grit uh, into the business world. Like I was a blue collar worker. Uh, it really like makes you appreciate, you know, sitting at a, a desk, you know, you have air conditioning when it's hot, yeah, right. you know, heat when, it, when it's cold. So I and, think blue and collar work really, really, really builds character, man. Right. The, the, so desk problems, once you do all that stuff, desk problems are like usually easier problems. They might be a little bit more stressful, but as far as like, you know, um, uh, personal strain, physical strain, uh, you know, when you're a trucker and you're not on time for a shipment or stuck in traffic or something like that, you you have a similar stress test going on that somebody at a desk dealing with with this stuff does. But then when you're there, sometimes you have the physical aspect, too. You know, so uh, back when I was in the, the facilities, there was times where, you know, I'm helping these guys load or, or whatever. And that's that wasn't part of my job description. But just as much as it's important for them to move on, I need to move on with my day to day too. So it's like, we can argue about this. We can, you know, scream at each other. We can do whatever, or we can get to a resolution. Right. Yeah. Like, I mean, it doesn't matter like what happens we, we all need to focus on how to solve it. I mean, it's already happened. Let's move on. Exactly. It's all in how you respond to whatever situations as to whether or not you're going to make it better or you're going to wallow in it, or you're going to make it worse. Like, it's it's real simple decision. Oh, no, of here, course. Right? I mean, what did you do? So you went into the shipper side. How did you get into, you know, what was the next step? So um, it, so there was uh, facility management, and I, I worked with a couple different facilities as, as far as that went on, on the shipping aspect. Um, like I said, started with the heavy equipment. Uh, my brother-in-law is working in logistics, and uh, he pulled me over because he needed help. And, you know, like you said, it's nice to have a desk and AC and, and all this <laughs> other stuff. The facilities that I was in, you know, back in the docks, you're not talking, you know, AC. I'm not getting any younger. So, you know, that's a young man's game. I'm, I'm ready to. Uh, but it, the other thing, too, is, is there's there's a demand for it. You know, there's there's a call for people that have the knowledge of, you know, how things work from the ground floor up, you know, um, to see some of these people that 
are in positions of responsibility that don't have a full picture and are trying to call the shots, um, you know, it, it, there's a demand. You know, you see it, uh, the perfect example on LinkedIn, you see it all the time. Shippers are talking about how they're treated by brokers. You see how carriers are saying they're treated by brokers. And it's, you know, there's a bad rap there, but that's because the uh, the, the entry bar into into that side is so low. Right. Like anybody can be a broker. It's no, almost like thing with that's the thing with logistics. The bar to entry is almost minimal. You almost don't need any school. You know, you just got to have the determination. You got to like the industry. But that's the thing. It opens the door to a revolving door system where everybody tries it out, makes you know some mistakes, doesn't like it, does bad business and they leave. And right. I mean, we have just such a low bar of entry that you're just getting whoever off the street sitting in a chair. They get two days of training and they're hitting the phones, man, calling you. So, right. Well, I, I'll hit you with a quick story that just just landed uh, uh, like two days ago, and then we're gonna get into some of the tougher questions that, that we're talking about because uh, you know I want to know. Um, so, I had a uh, I had a shipper. They need a shipment moved quick back to these these chassis, and uh, so I called my guy that was in the area. And within five minutes of, of getting this request from the shipper, I already have dude booked out, ready to go, next day pickup, all that stuff, right? But it was going to be towards the afternoon, next day pickup. The uh, the carrier calls me, my driver calls me. He's like, hey, Troy, um, I, I I blew a seal on my tire. I, is it possible to uh, maybe do pickup tomorrow? Without pause, I said, yeah, sure, no problem. I'm going to let the shipper know. And then it was just dead air on the phone. And I was like, are, are you still there? And he's like, well, yeah, but like, that's it. And I was like, what do you mean? That's it. And he's like, well, that, that seemed pretty easy. And I was like, would it make you more comfortable if I <laughs> yell at you? And at yeah, you and, and argue threatening you with stuff. <laughs> he's like, well, that's normally what I get. And I said, well, I don't want you to be uncomfortable. And I, I started in on him. I was like, hey man, you know, uh, I can't believe you didn't account for this. Why can't you see the future? Why are you getting everyday life stuff, you know, involved in your day-to-day -day business? Is this really how you operate? And then flipped the switch and was like, hey, so are you good now? You're going to be there tomorrow morning for pickup and everything? Yeah, I everything? think you the, the one thing carriers need to understand and they really need to try to work on is he did the right thing there telling you, hey, I have an issue. I'm going to get it solved. Can I pick it up in the morning? Like not just calling you saying I broke down, remove me from the load. A hundred percent. I think carriers need to honestly bite the bullet lose that day of gross to make the relationship because when you tell the broker hey i'm broken down or i'm gonna miss your pickup but i will stay on this freight i will lay myself over at no cost to you and i will move this freight i agreed to move in the morning i mean that right that is something that you know i always do and that's something that will like the brokers will take that and be very happy with with that solution because then they don't have to recover right. it i mean mm -hmm. stuff happens in trucking if i can't make the pickup i can't make it my next best solution is to offer you to move the freight, you know, in the morning. So. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, and the other thing with that too, that uh, a lot of, a lot of times neither side really sees is, is that, uh, uh, yeah, you're right about it, it. It causes an extra wrinkle to have to recover that load. But the other problem is, is the optics don't necessarily look good to a shipper if a driver falls off either. You know what I mean? So um, uh, the, it turns out to be that, uh, you know, carriers are as much of my customer as the shipper is, right? Like I, I'm, I'm a middleman really, right? I'm facilitating what's going on. I'm providing as much information as possible. And that's my role, right? But I'm you taking... see, you understand your role as a broker. The broker is supposed to sit on the fence and he's supposed to be as much on the carrier's team as he is on the customer slash shipper's 100%. team. And that when you break down being a freight broker, that is that's the definition of that. And I think, you know, you see all day, every day, people are like, my customers, the, the customer, they're the ones that pay the bills, the carriers, the dime a dozen. And I mean, that's just like the right. definition of your job is to sit on the fence and be 100%. You know, value Absolutely. to both sides. Carriers are not a dime a dozen. Like I'll come out there and say that right now, you know, I mean, you, can you get somebody to cover? Yeah. But the problem is, and everybody's running into this on both sides is that uh, some of the scams that are going on out there, I mean, they hit both sides. We have to vet our carriers because, you know, it doesn't do us any good with the customers. We don't look any better to the customer, the shipper, if they lose their product, whatever freight they're moving. 
right? That's on us because they entrusted us to move it. So if during the vet vetting process, we, you know, uh, uh, end up hiring some sort of scam artist, we're, we're looking just as bad too. You know what I mean? But what kills me is, is that carriers get that too. They're getting, uh, hired to do a job, they go out there, they bust their ass on that job, and then they don't get paid. And that's different than somebody that goes into an office and just loses time. Like these guys are losing fuel costs. These that's, guys are, are putting wear and tear on the assets. Point I try to make to people, and brokers will always defend themselves and say, Well, I had an employee cost and this cost. Like carriers have upfront two day, they lost money out of their pocket two day right. immediately. Like they right. spend fuel, they spend. Maybe it's a company driver. They already they have to pay. Like I have to pay that company driver, whether I get paid or I don't get paid. Right. So 100%. I mean, the you know, carriers have upfront costs. Not to say brokers don't. I mean, of course, everyone has costs to run a business. Sure. Um, I just you know the the upfront cost uh, on a carrier is just, it just sucks, man. Like that you know one, you're gonna pay absolutely. the fuel right away. Like right away, as soon as you turn the truck on, you're you're starting to lose money. So yeah. Okay, so, you know, I mean, this is kind of a real good segue into, uh, uh, you know, some of the conversation that we're looking to have. So, like, getting into that as far as, you know, knowledge and, and figuring out how some of that works, you know, uh, I guess a great way to start it off would be is, is, like, the international fuel tax, right? Like, as a carrier, and, and exactly what you were just talking about, uh, about losing that cost, like, right up front, like, what goes into how does that affect your your uh pricing process well i mean it really comes down to this um any normal carrier anybody that's doing correct business is gonna sit down they're gonna look at the lane with their deadhead miles they're gonna look at the lane you know for what it is i mean my pricing from the northeast to, to chicago is gonna be severely different than my pricing from chicago to the northeast so i mean step one evaluate the market the lane um, that comes with experience, obviously. You have to know where you are, step one. Step two, you evaluate your your total miles. I mean, I know in this market, I say it a lot, like to brokers on the phone, I know my deadhead's not your problem, but it's my problem. And unfortunately, you know, I tell them you're paying very fair for the loaded miles, but I have to drive, you know, 140, 180, 110, 90 miles. You know, I have to factor in the fuel to get to the pickup. And in this market, I mean, it's tough to, to get paid for deadhead these days uh, mm -hmm. on the spot loads, but you have to factor it in. You know, it's part of part of the game. Um, I mean, pricing simple, man. You just got to know where you are. You got to know the market. You got to know what did you do it for last week? Try to be close to that. I mean, okay. a lot of a lot of dispatchers look at the DAT lane rate. Um, I mean, I always bring it up, but I don't quote off that. Like, and I, that's I, what I was about to ask. How how accurate do you feel that it is? Um, honestly, in this moment, it's in my opinion, if you get the DAT rate like today, uh, like if I hit the spot board today and I get the DAT lane rate, that's that's great because it's always higher. Like I swear brokers are pricing like to move the freight. They just look at the DAT rate minus 300, 200, 100, 400. <laughs> like it's never the DAT rate when you call right. in for a shot. Right. So, um, okay. So it you know, to give everybody the the aspect on the other side, like there's a lot of similar consideration that goes in for me when I have to price this out to the shipper, right? Um, I I don't typically like you depend on the the spot rate from DAT, but you know you have to factor in fuel costs, you have to factor in time for the driver, like like we talked about. You know, that's that's somebody sitting behind the wheel. Somebody sitting behind the wheel of the truck is no different than having to pay somebody to sit behind a computer at a desk. Right. Yeah, you know what drives so, me nuts? I actually, uh, I don't know if brokers understand the time thing. Like they'll price out a load that's let's call it 600 miles, 500 yeah. miles, and they'll price it out and they'll try to move it scheduled for two days of transit. Like that's insane to me. That's a one day run. I'm yeah. going to price you so much higher because you just wasted basically a day of time because I could have, like right. it's an eight to three, eight to three both ends. And you want me to deliver it in two days. Like I can't do that. Uh, no, not absolutely the price not. you want to move that for sure. Right. So uh, that is, there's another good question. How about how many miles do you think your drivers cover a day? I mean, hey, you know, you have every driver's different, right? Um, especially Andrew with Jim. what I do, power only. I can run four small loads in a day. I can run one load 700 miles. A guy can get there by lunchtime tomorrow. Um, ideally, the trucks 
supposed to be moving 450 to 600 a day it's kind of a minimum i mean if you're running under 500 miles a day it's kind of tough to to be where you want gross wise but at the same time right I can go run three short drop and hooks for 200 miles and my RPM and gross will make more sense. So right. I think people need to understand that you don't just look at the gross, you have to factor in rate per mile. And a lot of owner ops will, will fight me on that. And I'll tell right. them, listen, when you get your paycheck on Friday, you fight with me on Friday because right. if you're running 2.7 RPM on, let's say 4,000 gross, or you're running 9,000 gross, 1.5 RPM, you're just going to kill yourself to work hard and you're not going to keep any of it. So. Right, right. <clears throat> so um, what do, you, do you have any tools for analytics when, when you're doing this? Do you just go off, like you said, pretty much DATs, you know, spot rate? Or, or... I mean, this is basically how I run my, like this is how I dispatch freight. I know my trucks, I know my drivers, step one. I know what they like to run. I know where they like to be. That's the first. Like when I call on freight, I, I rarely have to even call my, my drivers because they trust me. They say, Sam, I know, you know, we work together long enough. I trust what you're doing. Like, let's just, let's just run what you want to run. And, um, you know, once, uh, once you do that, my analytics go like this. I know what I ran this lane at last week. Like I do a lot of Illinois to Ohio, a lot of Illinois to Kansas. So I'll be like, okay, I ran this 16 last week. Uh, I see it again this week. I know the market hasn't shifted like at all. Right. So I'm just going to go back in and tell the broker, hey, I ran it last week for this price. Let's run it, you know, same price. Um, I don't use much tools to, to analyze the market because if it's spot market, I, I already know what it is. I have trucks. I'm looking at it every single day, day in and day out. I mean, I know what the lanes are paying before I call. Like uh, my favorite is when brokers don't post the rate because then i have a chance when they post the rate let's say i know it's 300 dollars less than it should be i i tend to just skip that because i'm gonna call the guy and be like hey i know this is supposed to pay 900 you have it posted at 550. i know we're not gonna we're not gonna meet up at a number i want to meet up at so. right hey i i don't know you might be surprised especially on these chassis lanes you might want to if you're 300 <laughs> off you might want to call those guys i'm just saying Hey, but, honestly, like the the chains of binders freight is for power only. It's awesome. Like we we yeah. finally got our first unit equipped, and he learned how to use it. And those those lanes pay money, man. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, as we know, that's what uh, I kind of specialize in, at least right now. But um, okay, so that that's the next step. So you're talking about calling on these guys, you know, um, and you're like, if they don't have the rate, you're not even going to waste your time. What do you need to see on there? Like, what is enough posted on there that just like tempts you into a call and you're like, man, I shouldn't, I should have had this on there too. And then, yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, this is how it goes for me. Like I know mostly by some point in the day, one, 2 PM central, where my truck's going to be tomorrow. So I start taking a peek. Um, power only is a lot different than dry van or reef or fly. It's a lot harder to pre-book power only freight. So, I mean, I'll just check it out. I'll say, hey, this is what's happening tomorrow. Um, and start to get a, like an idea of the lane rate for, for the following day. Then I see where my truck's at. I have an idea in my head when I start every morning. I say, if I want to go here, this truck's going to make about this. I start to see the market. What's the top three loads in that area? What, what are they priced at? And then I start to get an idea. Okay, I'm going to make about, let's say, 1400 today on this truck. So when I start seeing loads come out, as soon as I see something, you know, 11, 10, 50, 12, or if it's going on a lane that I like somewhere where I want to go, where I know I'll catch better freight tomorrow. Right. Uh, basically, I just have an idea in my head. I have a number. This is what I want to make on this truck in this area today. And as soon as I see someone somewhat in that area, I'll start, you know. But when guys are posting freight for a dollar to a mile, dollar four, I'm not going to call you, man. Like, I mean, I'm not in Florida. My, my truck's not going to haul a dollar to a mile, you know, out of Ohio. I'm not pulling that freight. I'm not going to waste my time even calling you. Because if you're posting up rates like that, like, I already know you're the, not the type of person I want to do business with. Like, you know right. that that's too cheap. You know that that lane rate is not that price. So Right. I so mean, what about comments? What do you need to see in the comments? Hey, honestly, man, pickup time, delivery time. That's it, man. Just put the dates and the time. That's so helpful. As soon as I see two days transit, as soon as I see a 7 p.m. delivery tomorrow, I'm, I'm not calling. I'm not wasting my time anymore. So right. as far as the comments go, just put the dates and the times, and that saves everybody so much time. But right. I'll get the crowd that's going to come in and say, oh, nobody reads the comments. 
like when I email freight, I copy paste their comments into the email. So they see that I've read it and I already like know, you know, what, right. what's going on. So. Right. Well, for sure that, you know, uh, uh, I knew that uh, you had read the, the comments just based on some of the interaction that we had. And look, you know, I mean, we both know there's a lot of people that don't read comments on both sides. Don't provide <laughs> information. Don't don't, you know, read comments or any of that stuff. And it's like. It, going back to the fence thing, like it's on me to provide information, right? And I don't understand why anybody holds information back. Like, what what is that? Yeah, I mean, honestly, like if every broker on every load, like I honestly wish DAT would just enforce a rule or any load board, like the broker load boards, like they're specific. Each company has their load board. I love those boards because every load has the pickup time, the delivery time right there. Every single load has it. I wish the, the big load boards would enforce a rule where if you want to post freight, you have to post the times because that would just save everybody. Like, like when I want I to go understand to late pickup, why anybody wouldn't. When I want to go look for a late pickup on a truck, I know it's going to have like an empty at a later time. Instead of hitting the phone and calling 100 people, I'll just go filter the broker load boards because I can go through 300 loads in three minutes and I can right. see late pickups as soon as I see a late pickup, you know? So that's mm -hmm. huge man if you're a broker just post the pickup and delivery time and date like that's gonna save me so much time it, right. answer this for me it's a conspiracy i've had in my head for a long time all right Do brokers purposely not like post stuff so i have to call them so you guys can try to sell me stuff like is that true oh yeah 100 100 <laughs> absolutely no so i mean like I, i'm not in the market for that like i i'm one <sighs> I, I don't feel like I should sell it. Like, I don't have a problem negotiating rates and stuff. Um, you know, you, you got to find that. And look, uh, frankly, what's going to end up happening is, is if I've worked with somebody before, they're going to get a better rate than, than somebody that's brand new. If I have to go to the load boards, it's because mm -hmm. my regular guys are, are unavailable for whatever reason, right? So um, the, the thing that comes down with all that is, is that, these guys are trying, and that's why I ask, what is enough to get your attention to call, right? <laughs> because that's what it is. They're, they're dangling that that bait out there, and then you call, and then it's almost like a yeah, sales And the first thing they say to you is, my delivery is at 9 p.m. tomorrow. Do you want it? No, I don't buy. And they yeah. don't even start the call. <laughs> they don't even start the call like that. They always go through, like, pick up is 8 to 3. It's 40,000 mm. pounds. It picks up here. And it but, has a delivery tomorrow. <laughs> like yeah. They just got to hit you at the end with it. So. But look, my frustration for that is, is that I'm one that does put all that information on there. Right. And then I still get the, hey, I need details on this. And it's like, <laughs> I got to I got to go through all this again. Yeah. Like all of that is on there. And you want me to. to I mean, if I was a broker and I posted all the details and somebody called me, I would instantly have no faith in that carrier. I'd be like, man, 100%. you guys can't yeah. even read the post. Like, And that goes down to what you're talking about with, um, you know, you don't even want to do, uh, do business with the broker that, you know, posts whatever in their outside of the range or whatever. You already know. We, we keep hitting this one, man. Th this is like the biggest carrier conspiracy. I mean, it's it's true, but it's not as prevalent as people would try to make it seem like. Like, I mean, brokers do post ghost loads. They do. You know, this is where it gets unethical. I don't right. mind if you post on, on the AT or some load board that says this is not a real load looking for rates. You know, I, I don't mind that. The That's... problem is when I call you and you act like you have the freight in your hands and you tell me all the details and then I give you a quote and then you tell me, oh, let me go check with the shipper. Let me go, you know, do you have the right. freight or you don't have the freight? Like that's, right. that's the unethical part. When they provide right. you the load as if it was ready to be shipped, as if it was in their hands. That's the part where I, I have an issue with that. There, there's, there's a certain amount of give and take on that. Um, I, I'm not too thrilled with with that process. I, I don't necessarily uh, advocate for that kind of, of uh, you know, uh, business strategy. Direction. Yeah, <laughs> you know, um, like you can do that live time, right? Um, but the problem is, and the reason why that happens is, first of all, most of the brokers don't have dedicated carriers that they go to and have a relationship with, right? So they don't have anybody in the first place that they could say, hey, check it out. What's a good rate, right? Um, but further than that, I've encountered it myself. I've had my top guy. I'm like, hey, check it out. I have this coming up. You know, I'm looking to quote the customer. 
uh, and you're going to be a large part yeah, of it. Like you can be busy. If you're a broker and you've developed your relationships, you know, you can hit me up. Like my my favorite brokers will hit me up and say, "Hey, this is upcoming. What would you be able to run it for?" I'll help those guys out because I have a relationship with them. They've helped me out. Like I have no reason to not help quote their freight because that it might fall into my hands anyways but, but you have I mean, we have no relationship if we have zero relationship and you're just trying to like get me to do your job for you then that's where we're, we're gonna have an issue you know? okay yeah yeah no that makes sense but so in my experiences is that even though carriers know numbers for like their own you know uh, uh operations and everything the the problem is is that they still shoot too high Right. So if I open the door for somebody and this is this is direct personal experience, if I open the door for somebody and say, hey, check it out, this lane is coming up with some volume on it. You're going to be a large part of it. Help me get a get a quote. I going they that quote you, you like 10 per mile. Yeah. Man, I'm telling you. And the problem is, is that after <laughs> the fact, once I do my homework and I'm like, man, that's, you know, a little bit high. The, the customer's not having it or whatever. The problem is, is that that number is already out there between this carrier and me, right? So now there's that tricky spot of, okay, so if he accepts it in his mind, he's admitting I quoted too high. Yeah. You see what I'm I mean, saying? So I there's think, that dynamic there. I think there's a fine line between quoting what you need and a little bit higher. Like when I quote freight, there's a number in my head before I pick up the phone, before anything, before I make any offer, I put a number in my head. This is the the minimum I'm going to hold this for, and this is the number I would love to be at. And right. then I take my high number and I add a little bit extra to it, like a like 100, 200 bucks sure. to my high number. Because like I can't go back down. Once I make my quote, I make my quote. Right. But there are two numbers in my head when I look at any load. The, the mm -hmm. break even, where I'm willing to go the lowest, and where I'm happy at. And I quote a little above the happy number. And, you know, that's it. But I feel like if you're a carrier and you're quoting freight insanely high, especially to your regular customers and brokers, they're going to start to lose faith in you because you you should know the lane rate. The broker should know the lane rate. And if you're coming in like 1500 bucks higher than what you should be, I right. mean, it just kind of looks like you're, you're not doing serious business at that point to me. Sure, absolutely. But and so that's what I'm saying, though, is, is that, you know, that's kind of where these guys uh, require those ghost loads as like a crutch, right? Like they want to test the market. They can't go out to somebody and get an accurate one. Like, like what we were just talking about mostly. Um, so, so they go to the ghost loads. So that's for sure a thing, but you know, how prevalent is it? I don't know. I mean, that's there, the thing. carriers will make a big deal about it. Like there's a, like out of 900 postal loads, 800 of them are ghost loads. Dude, it's like, <laughs> it's like one load a day, two loads a day. Right. Like, I right. mean, that's the thing. People really love to complain about things that really are not a big deal. Like, right. like if right. a broker doesn't know how to do his job and you post a ghost load, you waste a minute of my day. Like, like whatever, dude, like, you right. know, just do what you got to do. But yeah, I mean, so, it's not 17 ghost loads every hour I'm running into, man. Right, right. Oh, let me get let me get with the shipper. I mean, how many times a day do you hear that? No. Dude, I asked, I started asking them straight up because I can I know now, like I know when people don't have freight, I'll be like, so is this a bid load? And like a lot of the time they'll be like, yeah, it's a bid load. I'm like, okay, like I'm not doing this. Just, <laughs> just hang. Right. I hate bid loads. Right. Don't put me on bid freight. Like, so uh, kind of along those lines, does it matter what you're taking? Does weight come into it when you're factoring? Oh, yeah. uh, come on, dude. How does weight not come into it? If I'm running, especially when you're running northeast mountains, like the mountain, like, that's the thing. I tell like a lot of people when I quote like like high on freight, like let's say I'm running Charlotte to Ohio, forty five thousand pounds. That's straight through the mountains, like. Right. And you're trying to get me to do the you know like let's say dollar nine two per mile two point one. I'm gonna tell you this is my quote. I know it's high, but you're trying to move forty five thousand pounds through mountains. You right. have to understand the lane that you're trying to sell me is pure mountains. That's a lot of stress on the vehicle. You have to, if you quote high, you have to explain yourself to the broker or to whoever, the customer. You have to tell them, this is the reason I'm quoting you this number. And they're going to understand, okay, you know what? Like, well, I mean, sometimes they're just going to get mad and hang up on you. But, I mean, if you just throw out a crazy number and you just wait for them to say something, they're going to just tell you no. I mean, right. If you're a carrier, you want to quote high on something, quote high because of something for a reason. 
say, right. you know what, I don't like this mountain lane. It's a lot of stress on my equipment. It's a little too heavy for this lane. Mm -hmm. And on the vice versa, like if you're a broker, like here's a good good tip for brokers. If you're posting freight on a mountain lane, which is like, you know, through West Virginia, through Pennsylvania, if any point of your trip is running through mountains, post the weight correctly. Because if you post 45,000 pounds just for the sake of it, a lot of carriers are going to filter certain lanes by certain weights. So your freight's not going to pop up. I'm not going to call you because it's too heavy for that lane. So when you're running complicated lanes where you know mountains are going to be there, elevation is going to be there, please post the correct weights. You're going to get a <laughs> lot more phone calls that way. And if it is 45K post, 45K, sorry, I'm not calling you. Hey, look, you know, I mean, it should just be accurate, period. But sure. Yeah, period. <laughs> I mean, yeah, let's put it that way. Like, uh, yeah, I don't uh, look again. Going back to well, that, I mean, we have the, we had that debate for a while where it was like, um, you know, carriers asking for more money if the the load weighs more than what what was stated. So then a lot of brokers will go, oh, I just post forty five thousand because then you know nobody can ask me for more, and if it's less, it's great. I'm like, yeah, that is a good strategy. Like, I'd rather you tell me it's forty five k and it's like ten k. I'd much rather that. But at the same time, now you're gonna alienate me from calling you about your freight because I think it's right. forty five thousand pounds. <clears throat> And it's not all right. Pounds, so. Well, and you know, that's the thing. So I always overestimate it, round up, you know, whatever. So it's always lighter than what I'm saying, than what it's actually going to be. But um, it's it's still close to accurate. You know what I mean? Because again, like you said, if, if you're putting filters on stuff and you're parsing through all this information, more information you have, like I want the guy, right? I want the guy for this lane. I don't want to get just some some dude. I want the guy that knows this lane at that price, knows what he's doing, and is ready to take it and is competent, not, you know, just some whatever. And going back to what you were saying with uh, your drivers, you know, and conspiracy theories and stuff like that, we get this all the time. <laughs> Let me check with my driver. Like, what? Really? No, no, no. What is your position? Like, as a dispatcher, what are you doing? If your drivers can't rely on you, you don't have the authority to make that call. What are you even doing? Just I patch you through the driver directly. Well, listen, that's, that's kind of a complicated conversation <clears throat> because, like I said, my drivers that I know and that I work with, like, you know, they trust me. I trust them. We know what we want. That's how I it should be. I call the guy because same. at the end of the day, truck drivers, uh, as, you know, most of them, they – they live in a truck, man. It's not an easy life. It's not an easy job. Some days, you know, they're, they're in a bad mood. Like, I don't want to ever promise you, like, even if I know the guy, sometimes I'll be like, I don't know, let me run this by him quick because, you know, they're humans and humans, you know, they have emotions and, you know, one day they could want to run this lane at 1500. One day they can want to run it at 5 million. You never know. And honestly, like, I, like you sit on the fence between a customer and a carrier. I sit on the fence between the driver and the broker or the customer. So it's kind of the same thing, but this is the thing. If I ever tell you, let me call my driver, I always tell them, especially in this market, we cannot be on the phone longer than 30 seconds. Like, like right. this is, if I'm calling you, I'm telling you, this is the load. This is what it is. Make a decision. If you start thinking about it, the broker's going to hang up. We're going to lose the freight. And at the same time, it's just not polite because what is there to discuss? I tell them, right. pick up time, delivery time, lane, rate. Do what you want it? Do you not want it? And yeah. I'll never go to a driver for five minutes. I always tell them, I don't have time for this. You know, if you want to think about it, think about it. Call me back. And then I'll tell the broker, I'm not wasting your time. If right. I call you back, I'll call you back. So. Yeah, but no, no, no. I get, hey, let me let me hang up with you. And I'm going to call you back after talking to my driver. Yeah. And but that's that. Comment, that's this comment is exactly my point. I tell all of my drivers, even new guys. The guy, I'll get new guys. They'll be here for like two days. I'd be like, buddy, you should trust me for five days to book your freight because if I start calling and start losing freight, we're not going to make money. And I told them, I always tell them, after five days, if you don't like what I'm doing, if you don't trust me to do my job, then we'll have a conversation. But as soon right. as I call you and put the broker on hold, we're literally at a race to lose the freight. Like, 100%. Absolutely. Cool. Absolutely. But, you know, I mean, I don't know. That goes back to some of the other stuff that we've been talking about too. So, you know, so I guess, let's see, this kind of takes us to these guys that are taking loads for like super cheap, right? Dude. Let's have that talk. Let's, let's have that talk where somebody, I, I want to find the comment here. Somebody literally just said this on, on X. Um, yeah, this actually was Adam. It was, the, it was this guy, Adam. He, he made this exact comment on X where he said, 
There is a sect of owner ops that don't understand that they set the rate, not shippers or brokers. They love a free market until it applies to them. And at the end of the day, that is the thing. Like the truck drivers like do not understand that hauling cheap freight is what's keeping freight cheap. And it's just as simple as that. So how how many does that take though? Just out of curiosity, like what's the number? What do you mean? Like what's what's cheap freight? <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> no, I'm pretty sure we all know what cheap freight is. But below operating cost freight. Let's let's start naming it like that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, but how many how many carriers doing that at that margin does it take to affect the market? I mean, dude, that's like we saw a truck stop drop some numbers a week or two ago where like seven or eight percent of truck capacity dropped in like seven days. So, right. I mean, I think we're starting to see, like, it's starting to crumble. Like, those guys, like, whoever's running the freight at those prices, whoever's accepting those loads, they're starting to go out of business now. And I was talking about this on a different podcast where we just need enough of these guys that don't know what they're doing to accept the freight. Finally, they go out of business, and then we'll be right back to having, you know, right. not enough trucks and too much loads. It's just right. never ending. It's just how it goes, like cyclical like you said i think on that podcast yeah absolutely whoever's so, taking the cheap freight eventually they're gonna not be able to keep doing it like that's just right. what it is well so uh, i mean there's a conspiracy going on out there uh you know getting back to that line of thinking or whatever that it's international shippers that they're crossing borders coming in picking up whatever i saw the, something about that like something about uh from the south coming they they can pick up one load to go back to the south like well both both it's it's uh, they're saying from canada and from mexico that, ah, from that canada too. <laughs> they, they're saying that that's that's affecting the market that these guys are able to because their operating costs are lower than ours you know <laughs> yeah but this is the thing this comment like until new carriers come in and start doing it all over again but that's the thing that's part of the cycle Carriers cannot come in, new carriers cannot enter the game because there needs to be a boom again of rates where it's very profitable and people are buying equipment and people are looking at trucking like it's super easy. Let's buy two trucks, make a million dollars until the rates get back to being very profitable. We're not going to see people entering this space. I mean, right. nobody in this in this day and age right now today is thinking, oh, I'm going to go buy a truck and I'll get rich because they see every it's day easy. everywhere. There's no yeah. money to be made. Everyone's just trying to survive. Like nobody's going to go out right now and say, oh, this is a great time to start being a truck driver. Like, you know, right. But, he, but here's the deal. And, you know, I think we've had this conversation before, too, which is that, OK, so I try and say. <laughs> this is great. Like, you know, this is what it is. I mean, I'd rather tell my driver, you know what, man, I'm not going to send you out there to work for free. I right. don't think this load makes sense for you on this lane. Right. I like I'll tell them, you know what, this load's cheap. Like I, I said to a guy today, you know what, this load's pretty cheap. But if we go look at our two-day average, you're at like 2.3 RPM. So I told him, you know what, let's haul this not great freight because we made a killing coming in yesterday. So when I average sure. it out, you're, you're profitable. But if right. I look at a load and I look at my guys like weekly gross, let's say it's like a Tuesday or a Wednesday, and I see if I take this freight, he's not profitable at all anymore. I'm going to say, man, I'm not sending you out there to drive for free. I don't want you to go work for free. It's better if you sit here and don't drive the truck for a day than to send you out there to literally work for free. Because that's what right. it is. Like, well, less than free because once you factor in, you know, uh, wear and tear on the vehicle that you don't see, you know. In yeah, issue. hidden costs. Hidden costs nobody thinks about. I mean, there you need to factor in a, a rate per mile for maintenance. I think it's right. somewhere around like, I can't remember. It was like 18 cents or something like that, where you should be budgeting a certain RPM, just maintenance per load, you know. So. Right. Yeah, for sure. I mean, LaShawn's right. Trucking's boomer, boomer bust. I just made a tweet about this too. Like, you either get in as owner op and you make a crazy amount of money or you make literally no money. You should have just been working as a company driver. Right. And, but that's where we get back to relationships because if you're just a spot market rat and all you move is spot market and you have no connections like and i want to say this to all carriers like you don't have to have direct shippers what what a customer means to me like is a broker let's say i find them on dat we run really good business the guy is very polite he does really good business first load i'll tell him let's keep in touch here's my email message me your load list here's my truck list a customer doesn't have to be a direct shipper. A customer, to me, 
is anybody that I do very like repeat business with anybody right. who does good business aligns with my values, aligns with how I want to operate my trucks. That to me is a customer. So right. if I find you on DAT and we, we move to, to doing our business off DAT, just straight emails, that's a customer. Now you're now a customer to me, you know, For it's sure. not transactional. We're trying to build something, you know, For sure. And you know, that helps with that, you know, uh, increasing that bar to entry, right? Because if I'm not on DAT, because I have enough dedicated carriers that I can I can depend on, I I have my own CRM just for carriers, you know. <laughs> and the first thing that I do is is I go to those guys to cover my loads before even and, looking at DAT. Yep, I mean same. First thing in the morning, or even <clears throat> just before I get off for the day, I, I hit up all my regulars. I'm like, hey, this is where we're at. What do you got? Right. You know. I Absolutely. hope to cover as many trucks as I can before the day even starts or, you know, first thing in the morning with the guys I want to work with. Yeah. And so that that uh, increases that bar for these guys that are just trying to get in to make a quick buck because, you know, they don't have those relationships. And again, you know, like you said, you don't have to have the direct to, to customer relationship. You can depend on that. But that being said, and this might be, you know, uh, uh, odd mindset for a broker, but um, I don't want to be the only source of business for a carrier, right? Like, I don't see that that, that is going to be, you know, a, a profitable um, a, a way of, of doing business, right? Like, I, I consider what I'm doing to be, you know, fair, more so than fair, really, you know, um, I have the ability to do that though, because like we've talked about, we're in a niche market when it comes to power only and and you know yeah, yeah, specifically you, I mean, moving chassis. Sidebar here for everybody watching this. So um Troy hit me up a long time ago and told me the very first thing he ever told me was, Hey, I do a lot of power only freight, I'm a broker, and this and that. And then things just kind of, you know, happen how they happen. And then like he hit up like again he was like yeah i have this freight power only and i told him oh you should have told me you're on power only freight and we scrolled back up he sent me a screenshot the first thing he ever told me was that he runs power only freight so if you're a broker or a carrier just tell people what you do you know tell them every single day what you do like if you're especially if you're in a niche you know if you're only running flatbed if you're only running reefer if you're only running hot shots or you know especially when you're niche spaces or niche lanes just tell people what you do every day. You know, you're going right. to find Troy. Me and Troy found each other because we, we tell people what we do and we're in a very niche market. I mean, I don't know very many power only carriers or power only brokers for that matter. So, right, for sure. It's it's definitely a smaller percentage of what's out there, you know. Um, but that being the case, it, it gives us, you know, uh, a certain amount of leverage in the industry, right? So, I mean, do, do you, how do you calculate your market? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> no, Google Maps, I, I, dude, Google is on top of it. They have the best rates ever. Dude, I don't know why Google hasn't released proprietary, <laughs> like, trucking maps yet. Like, I mean, I would That's love if Google question. Maps just had a truck button and they just integrate a PC miler into Google Maps. I would be so, so down for that. Right. Right. So um, I found that um, DAT is pretty accurate when it comes to uh, the, the miles for trucks. Um, so as far as like calculating miles, yeah, I, I go off DAT more than anything else. The only time I get maps involved is, is that um, I like to get uh, familiarity with the, uh, the depots that I send the, uh, the carriers to just so that, you know, if there's... Uh, there's been some points where they turn into the wrong spots, you know, and they're looking for. Whatever. I mean, you know what drives me nuts is when DAT or brokers, like, like I had a broker, this happens to me like once every week or two, where I'll be somewhere near Buffalo or Rochester and there's freight going to Michigan and it's like 300 miles and it's not because that's if you go through Canada. And the guy, <laughs> that happens to me every single day. That's been happening to me for years. But this is the, the kicker to that story they price the freight or at least they price the freight to the carrier that they're trying to sell it to with going through Canada miles. So they're like, Oh, 700 bucks, 300 miles. Like buddy, it's like 550, 600 miles. If you go through Cleveland, through Ohio, and right. they just can't seem to understand that certain lanes like need to be looked at. Like you can't just be like, Oh yeah, just everybody's going to go through customs, go through Canada to deliver this freight. It's like, no, Oh sure. Why not? not? Do that. Like, yeah, stop at Niagara Falls on the way too, you know. Yeah, like, stop at the yeah. casino, gamble away your life. Right. You know? <laughs> right. Like, but this goes back to what we were talking about earlier, which is that, uh, you know, 
you don't necessarily get these people that have that ground floor understanding. And I mean, that, I mean, that's, that's just looking at a map, right? Like, I mean, that is like ground floor understanding uh, how to read a map. Everyone, like, do you know how to read a map? Do you know how to look at a map? And yeah, I mean, that's the thing though. I think a lot of people come into this industry, you know, we, we, we've all heard it. They come fresh out of college into a huge company. They don't get good training. They don't really care. They're being transactional. They're just trying to make unrealistic margins on every load they sell to please somebody who wrote it on a piece of paper. And I'm honestly like getting to the point where I really love doing business with like one person at a huge company or like a smaller brokerage because they're going to care. Like they actually look at stuff. They train their employees. I mean, when you hit up like those major five companies, I swear nine out of those 10 calls, that guy or girl has not worked in this business longer than like 60 days. Right. And people right. ask me all the time. They say, when I ask them, because I, I run Power Only, I'll call and I'll be like, is this a hook and drop? And someone will tell me, no, it's a 53 dry van. I'm like, fuck, bro. Like, like, it's just the basics, the basic things, you know? Right. Like when you call a broker or if you guys call a carrier and you guys can figure it out in like 20 seconds, you're like, the guy starts to tell you, like, no, what's the pickup time? He tells you, what's the delivery? He tells you, what's the weight? And in 20 seconds, you guys both know that you, you've you been doing this. You both understand your jobs. You understand your roles. There's so much trust that's built if you can do your job efficiently and, you know, you provide evidence that you know what you're doing. <laughs> I mean, but, you know, I mean, that kind of great for like a little bit cheaper if if the guy or girl on the other end of the line knows what they're doing like if they know how to do their job and they tell me hey listen i've been doing this i know that this is the lane rate unfortunately i'm a little below it this week i'll start to trust those people because i know i'm not going to have a, a missing pickup number i'm not going to have a missing first come first serve delivery you know sold as first come first serve and i, right. I work with people that understand the intricacies quicker and, and that's just what it is so well and that that goes to you know this uh this bar to entry uh, as well too and and building relationships and and even scams right like some of the scam stuff that uh <laughs> yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't, know <laughs> doesn't know what dead miles are like. mm -hmm. yeah and and that's that's the funny stuff too is is that so you, this relates straight to what we were talking about with uh, uh, the carriers that are messing it up by taking the, the freight at, at, at too low of a price point, right? Well, it's the same thing when you deal with these brokers and give them business when they don't know what a deadhead is, when they don't know what a bobtail is, when they don't know any of these terms. And you as a carrier know, and there's something, there's a flag that goes off right? There's something that says, man, there's something not right with this. And yeah. one of two things is going on. Either it's a scam and, and then you're going to pay for it in that regard. Or best case scenario is it's exactly what we're talking about. Somebody has no experience, was thrown in there, doesn't know what's going on. And what you're doing is, is you're enabling that cycle to continue because you're validating their job. By, I mean, by there's a fine line to that as well. Like when I call somebody and I know that they're new, like, I'll try to deal with it. Like, I'll try to be polite. We all start somewhere. Like, you can't just be like, yeah. oh, this person doesn't know there and just hang up. Like, no, but, I mean, and I'm not saying have, that at all. No, but... of course. But even if you have a lot of training, there's still in trucking, something can happen you've never seen before, even if you've been doing it 50 years. Like, oh, yeah. You know, my oh. driver calls me and says, my brakes are on fire. I'm driving down the, the on ramp of the highway. My truck is on fire. And right. it's like, how do you, like, you know, you can't plan for a lot of these things. So, we all have right. to be nice to each other. I think that's the thing. Brokers and carriers need to understand that they need each other and they need to understand that making a good relationship with each other is going to put you further ahead in life than saying every broker sucks. I hate brokers. Brokers shouldn't exist. They're, they're taking 50% margins. Right. I mean, brokers want to pay carriers more because the higher that the carrier gets paid, the higher the broker is going to get paid, the higher, you know, margin they can put on freight. So when freight's yep. cheap, it's cheap for the broker and it's cheap for the carrier. And I think right. carriers don't understand that brokers don't want cheap freight either because they're making a percent of a smaller number. So, And, you know, I've had that conversation with carriers before, which is that, you know, when we can't see eye to eye, I, I tell them, I'm like, look, you know, I, I understand. Just like you tell your drivers, I don't want you working for free either. 
you know, but here's the deal with some customers that, that get uh, stubborn on certain things. The only way that they'll come up with, with what they're going to pay for that freight is, is if it doesn't move, you know what I mean? So uh, yeah. look, I'm, I'm not going to force this on you. Don't take it. And, and I'm fine with that because that gives me the leverage to come, come back to the customer and say, Hey, um, whether that's on me and, and I got the quote wrong, or if there's a change in the market or, or whatever happened, you know, um, it, sometimes you just have customers. They're like, Hey, I'm, I, this is what I'm paying to move this. That's it. And it has to be gone by Tuesday. And it's like, yeah. I mean, I think um, carriers as a whole need to understand that when they accept super cheap freight day in and day out, they're contributing to the problem. They need right. to understand that shippers are also like aware of the market conditions. You know, they, they know this has been going on for two and a half years. Like shippers are fully aware that market conditions have changed. They're fully aware that they don't have to pay crazy money to move their freight anymore. Right. And I think carriers just see brokers as they're stealing from us. They're stealing from us. But if you build relationships with the right people, it makes business easier. The rates right. will improve. You you have to prove as a carrier your, your value as well. I right. mean, if you've never run a load for somebody, how do you expect them to, to treat you good and, and pay you top dollar? All you can say is, oh, I'm really good at driving this truck. I promise I'll be there. With no right. track record, you're, you're the same as everyone else. So. Well, and that, that's what I was saying earlier. You know, uh, if if I'm going to DAT and finding somebody or, or truck stop, or whatever load board, and I'm finding somebody for the first time, you know, I have to establish that relationship, right? Like there's, it, if I'm paying my top guy that I have, you know, on my list to move something at, at this rate, um, it's probably not going to be the same rate for for somebody fresh out. Because like you said, I don't know any better. I can go out there and say I'm the best broker out there and you have the privilege of working for me too. You know what uh, I mean? I so, think carriers like, need to learn this recipe. This is a recipe I like to use. If I call somebody and it's, let's say, a spot market load and the rate's not exactly what I love, but the person on the other end of the phone or email is, you know, efficient and I can tell, you know, they know what they're doing. I'll tell them, you know what? I don't like this rate. It is what it is. Let's run this freight. You know, let me do a good job here. Let's see, you know, how we're like, you know, let's see how the first load runs and let's keep in touch. And maybe on the next one, you'll have some more money in it. Maybe on the next one, you'll, you'll see I'm doing good business. You'll want to work with me. You'll want to give me better money. And I think everyone needs to understand that you got to be, you know, people are penny smart and dollar stupid. They're like, oh, I don't want to lose 80 bucks today. But that 80 bucks, you're opening the door to build something, to, to build future business, to build a relationship yep. with somebody, to prove yourself. And um, I think there's just too much tension in the market. And, you know, people are just uneducated. They don't look at the big picture. They don't look at relationships. Everyone's a shark. Everyone wants to make as much as they can today. They don't look at tomorrow. Uh, I think that's the biggest issue we have is the relationship building is like, it has to it's like a skill somebody somebody has to start teaching people i guess because yeah. it used to be like normal in business to build relationships with people and a handshake was a handshake and nowadays right. it's like who can rip off who the most and you know let's forget about building any relationships so. right but again you know i mean if, if we're the ones that are set out uh as different because of that you know then then we're cornering a, a section of the market you know and uh going back to uh we had a back and forth on this you know, I get it, uh, and I I know you get it too. Brokers, uh, I think that's where the conversation started. Oh well, I moved this uh, at this rate just last week, and it's like, well, I got two goldfish. <laughs> it's like, what yeah. what does that have to do with what we're talking about right now? You know, I mean, we, I just want to put it out there. Like me and Troy tried to run some freight, didn't work out. Um, but you know, we dealt with it correctly. And Troy, this is the thing as brokers you got to do. Like Troy did this, and this was something that made him stand out to me immediately. He sent me an email with the paperwork and he said, listen, if you take a picture of whatever equipment we're running and you send it back to me, you can release your driver. That's enough. You don't have to wait for my approval. You don't have to sit around. I've been doing power only for a long time. No broker understands what freight they're moving. They, they've never offered to say, hey, once you send us this paperwork or this picture that matches what I've sent you, you're released. You don't need me. It, it's the little details. It, it takes little bit of effort to stand above everybody else to, to do good business. It's such an easy thing to just to say to the guy, Hey, I know my shipper. I know if you have this picture, we're good to go. I know where you're delivering to. I know if you're 30 minutes late, it'll be fine. It's just those little details that set people apart in this business to me. Yeah, it's not absolutely. overly complicated, you know? 
And you're saying that it didn't work out, but I mean, look, even though you didn't move the freight, I don't see that situation <laughs> as it didn't work out, right? It worked out just fine. We're, we're hey, here we are on the podcast. podcast. Here we are talking, building future business. I mean, right. it that's worked out what it's about, fine. man. Because so if you have problems, like you said, it's how you deal with them. If you as a carrier are about to have a really bad fall off on some freight, you call up that broker immediately. You tell them, hey, I'm going to fall off of this freight. I apologize. How do we fix this together? I don't want you to, to be mad at me about it. Right. You know, if you're a carrier, if you can be proactive and you know maybe four hours before pickup, something's going to go wrong, just tell the broker. I'd rather give you this back and let you recover it now than to have a problem in four hours and we're both screwed. So Right. Absolutely. What you did it's gave me plenty honest. of time. It got covered. You know, it was it was uh I wouldn't even see say disappointing. I mean, it just it kind of sucked that we didn't get to move it together, but like it didn't change the relationship at all, right? Like there was no change to what, what that's happened. the thing. I mean, if <laughs> if a carrier's honest and a broker's honest then you just, you can problem. So you become a team. And I was watching some movie and it said, trust comes when action meets words. Right. I heard that the other day. I was like, that's great. You know, like words are words, but once the action meets the words from both ends, that's where trust happens, you know? Yeah. You know, and so look, you know, of course, as a broker, I'm going to be saying, hey, I'm available 24 seven. You have my direct line and everything else. But look, <laughs> just like stuff happens on the road, life happens. There's times where, I'm awake, my phone is on, but there's something going on that I can't answer, right? It happens to everybody. Uh, so even though I said I'm available 24 seven, that one time that it needed to happen, I wasn't available. And that's why I send those emails, right? Like, look, don't, 20 minutes matters. If you can't get a hold of me for 20 minutes, but you did what you were supposed to do, why Why do you have to sit around? Like, Oh man, it, in the free game, if you're not replying to, to people or, you know, emails within the, I'd say within two minutes to five minutes, you're slow, man. I yeah. mean, free moves. If you want to provide good service, especially as a carrier, on my end, if I get an email that says, what's your ETA, if I haven't already told them, I mean, most of the time I've already told them, they just hit me with a random tracking anyways. Right. But if you're not replying to people within the first minute or two or three, you, you know, it's just, like I said, it's the little things. Yeah. Fast responses, honest responses. Yep. If your ETAs are on point, people are going to trust you, you know? But I mean, that's other thing regulars. too. My regulars don't ask me to track loads. My regulars don't ask me nothing. They just say, here's the rate on, finish the load, call me when it's done, send me the POD. Nobody even cares, like, because they know if they give me their freight, I'm going to run it, and that's it. And, and that's what I was just about to say is, is that, uh, you know, you have these these brokers that are trying to tell you how to do your job. <laughs> you know, I understand that there's some customers that want updates on tracking and stuff. And, you know, that is what it is. But um, like, I'm I'm not telling you how to do your job. I'm not going to be calling you all the time and, and trying to get an update and everything else. Because with those relationships, what happens is, is that you're the professional in the lane that you're in. I'm the professional in the lane that I'm in. We came together to get something done, like you said, as a team. So Listen, you turn that. I go to my barber, and I'm not going to tell him how to do his. I'm not going to tell him how to do his business. Right. And if right. my barber comes into to my office, he's not going to tell me how to run my trucks. And Absolutely. If you're professionals, yeah. that's what it is. You know, you're good at your job. I'm good at my job. Let me do mine. You do yours. I say that to all my owner ops. I'm like, man, you work with me. You hired me to do a job to book you free. Let me right. do my job. I stare at this all day, every day. <laughs> You need to let me do my job. You drive the truck. You listen. You do your job. You be safe. You know, you keep the freight safely on the road. And, and that's yep. it. If you don't want a dispatcher, if you don't want to work with dispatch, then go self-dispatch yourself, you know. But if you want to yeah. hire me, if you want to work <laughs> with, with my company, then let me just let me do my job, you know. Yep. I mean, it's, it's so and that's, that's something, you know, going to <laughs> Yeah, that, that analogy <laughs> used to work a lot better when I actually had it like like a serious haircut. Now I just cut my own hairs. So. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, so your barber does tell you how to do your job right now, is what you're telling. Yeah, me. at this point, yeah, I tell myself exactly. Yeah, okay. how to do my all job. right, <laughs> just just to clear all that up for everybody watching. <laughs> oh man, I mean, let's close this out. You have any more questions? I mean, I think we did a good job. Like, just do your job correctly. That's Don't it. lie to people. That's Be it. honest. Treat each other with you know intention to do future business take a loss on one load as a carrier broker you take a loss you know 100 bucks on the next load and it evens out right. and you're doing business together you know absolutely yeah 
Absolutely. A hundred percent. You know, I mean, look, it's not hard. And I tell, I tell people this all the time, as far as like good business isn't difficult to do, right? Everybody knows what good business is. You know, some people have more empathy than others and they can put themselves in other people's shoes um, better than other people can. But I mean, look, it's, it's not hard. A real simple dumb it down to one line is, is what's right is right. Dude, I mean, like, that's... I tell people all the time, logistics, if nobody lies to anybody, this is the simplest job on earth. We're just moving freight from one place to the next. That's all we're doing. Like when you break down logistics, if nobody's lying and nobody's making mistakes, which I understand, you know, a dock worker slaps the wrong label. Somebody like there's stuff is always going to happen. But when you look at logistics, it's just picking stuff up and dropping it off. And yeah. it shouldn't yeah. be that hard. You know? Yeah, Absolutely. <laughs> But I mean, look at this. Uh, we we gotta get to the comments quick before we call it a day. If anyone else has any more comments, just just hit us up. Read any good books lately? As as a broker, um, <laughs> I don't read. I don't know how to read. So. Yeah, there we go. There we go. Now we're being yeah. honest. Now, yeah. <laughs> well, we gotta we gotta share that stuff. But you know, my Amazon account when I do look into uh, uh, book stuff is it's just totally out of whack right now. So I don't even bother with reading. Like it's overrated. Dude, I just started reading again because in Serbia it's kind of hard to find English books and uh, I picked <laughs> up a book from Machiavelli it was written in the 1500s because yeah. I thought this was going to be like a book to tell like you know how to be a leader how to run business but this is just like a war strategy book they're just like this is how you conquer countries I was like okay you can kind of apply it to business you're but. supposed to be able to apply that line yeah but it's get- so boring bro it's the most boring book I ever read <clears throat> <laughs> Well, you know, I mean, they, they were known for their uh, social media content back in, you know, 1500s and stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, it's a direct translation. But I mean, if that's it from you, man, you got any more questions? I mean, I like how you do your business. Shout out to you. Shout out to your company, SPI. You know, it doesn't Appreciate take much, like you said, to do good business. What's right is right. And that's it. That's it. That's it. No, man. I mean, uh, we pretty much covered everything. It it would be cool to get into a deeper dive on like the relationship building and how that goes down. You know, um, I don't think, I think ours is pretty, uh, pretty unique how it went down. Um, You know, especially the bet and and the screenshot, but, uh, and we still have to get back to that sometime. We'll we'll revisit that one. But, hey, uh, you, you write down some more questions and you're welcome anytime we'll we'll do a part two i love this topic i think this topic might be something i explore in this podcast a lot where we're gonna start bringing in people that like you know want to learn stuff and let's bring in some truck drivers that have questions to, about how dispatch operates let's bring in some some drivers that want to talk to brokers let's bring in some shippers that want to talk to carriers and I think this topic of having a safe place to to learn stuff and just ask questions to each other is something we all really need. And um, I hope whoever yeah. watches, it's like Troy hit me up and he was like, "Hey, can I call you and ask you a few questions? You know, to improve how to build relationships with carriers." I told him, "Just let's just do this on the podcast because we're gonna have the same conversation. We might as well do it in a place where people can see it and learn from it, and it's eternal." And I hope whoever watches this back will you know get some information on just how to treat each other how to do business how to build a relationship how to survive the worst market in history you know? right and so. it, it it takes relationships to do that stuff like you said the worst the, how do you expect to get through the worst without other people yeah i mean that's that's what it is man without relationships in this market you're, you're not you're not surviving so no. but anyways man i appreciate it thank you for your time thank you for for christening the new show I appreciate you coming on up. I loved it every minute. The branding is great. It was fun. And like I said, you know, hopefully we reached some people and changed some mind, provided some information to others. uh, Whoever wants to ask questions, send it to Troy, send it to me. We're going to run back part two at some point. We'll figure it out down the road. For sure. Thank you for your time. Thank you for being here. And, you know, just keep doing the right business. You're one of the good ones. Thanks for having me. Thanks for, uh, you know, doing what you do. You know, I mean, that's that's what this is all about. We're there's more out there. We'll find it. Yeah, I just want to give a platform to the people that really deserve it, and you know, that are gonna come and and, you know ask the right questions, and just the people that deserve to be kind of spotlight. I want to be a platform for for the good in this industry, and not just a megaphone for the bad. Because I I get tired of everybody's tired of it. Like, I mean, we're all just tired of hearing the same garbage every single day. This guy sucks. That guy sucks. Like. 
I want to start to bring in some people that are doing the job, you know, that are currently boots on the ground, doing good business. And I want to bring some, some like knowledge out there from the people on the front lines, not just the people on LinkedIn that are some influencers and think they know what they're doing. I want to bring in the real brokers, the real carriers, the real drivers, you know, the yeah. people that are here today in this market. I don't care if you quit this job two months ago, I don't trust you anymore because the market moves so fast. Right. You know, two months ago is two months ago. Today is today, you know? So, yeah, I mean, for sure. We'll get there. Thank you for episode one. Take it easy. And you know, we'll, we'll be back on at some point. All right, Alex. Hey, thank you. Appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, bro. Thank you for everybody who's here, who who watched, who's going to watch this back. That was episode one. I got a re- episode two is in the works for tomorrow. I'm not sure if it'll be live or recorded due to the weekend, but uh, we'll be dropping episode two and three next week. And like I said, thank you for, for tuning in.